going to talk to you about functional analysis. How many of you have done a uh, experimental functional analysis before? So um, today what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a couple of activities, and then I'm going to also talk to you a little bit about some considerations in general when you're designing a functional analysis and also some safety precautions that you want to take and consider depending on the nature of the problem behavior that you're evaluating. And then I'm going to talk more specifically about some different experimental conditions, some different test conditions, and the way that you design the control condition. And then we're going to end on an activity where we're going to design some control conditions depending on the kinds of test conditions that are included in the FA. So um, as you can probably read from below, um, you know, this presentation is a really, uh, will provide you with an easy foundation to kind of better understand functional analysis and also to consume the literature on functional analysis in an easier way. But it isn't um, training, so we're not going to be doing like a workshop style where I'll show you how to conduct the, um, different kinds of conditions, but I will try to, if somebody would um, be a volunteer, I would be happy to show you what those different conditions would look like and what the variations look like. Okay, so one of the reasons why I love functional analysis is because it's highly adaptable. So um, really we just need to understand the logic and the structure of a functional analysis and then we can modify that type of analysis to suit our clients. And so um, there is no standard functional analysis. Sometimes you'll see, for example, um, reference the Iwata et al. 1982, 1994 paper. And that's a really fantastic paper that showed the effectiveness of functional analysis for identifying the function of behavior. But keep in mind that that is a research protocol that they use to identify the function to then subsequently evaluate treatment. Those aren't necessarily um, the kinds of protocols that you'll follow exactly to conduct a functional analysis for your client. So we'll talk a little bit today about what the basics are of the procedure or of the different conditions, and then we're going to talk about variations of them. And so in my clinical experience, um, it's mostly the variations that um, yield the results that we need to identify the function, and usually kind of what we consider to be the standard functional analysis condition often doesn't sufficiently evoke problem behavior in order to assess it. So the first thing I want to do is show you a graph of a functional analysis because, um, you know, sometimes we'll do our best to arrange a functional analysis based on the information that we get from caregivers and from people who spend a lot of time with that individual. But even with our best efforts, sometimes we end up with functional analysis results that are less than helpful or that um, require some problem solving so that we can do a reassessment of the situation and maybe do um, a, a subsequent analysis. So what I'd like you to do is take a look at this particular graph. And um, I think it's reasonable if you want to kind of talk with people that are around you um, to talk about why you might get something like this. So um, here what you're seeing is sessions along the x-axis and then the rate of behavior along the y-axis here. And then um, in the toy play condition, which is considered, that was their toy, uh, that was their control condition of the functional analysis, you see high levels of behavior and an increase in trend. And then for the ignore, the attention, and the escape condition, you have low levels of behavior. So what I want you to do is think about um, what might be evoking problem behavior in um, the condition associated with high levels of problem behavior. And then kind of maybe think about what's going on in these other conditions that might be different. Now some of you have seen um, these data if you um, went to the BC ALPA presentation, but I think um, for some of you this graph might be uh, a little newer. So why don't you talk amongst yourselves and see what, come up with a hypothesis of why you think in the toy play condition it's evoking problem behavior. Yeah. 
But there is a little bit of anger in the escape. So one thing also to think about is what's happening in the escape in a typical toy play condition that's similar, and how is that different from an ignore and an attention condition? Okay, good. <laughs>
Usually, as a clinician, if I get here, or even this, we're gonna look at changing some things up. But this was obviously for a research project and it was looking at ambiguous results to functional analysis, so they had to run it out a little bit more to show that this was, um, that, the, that the toy play condition was um, evoking behavior and that that wasn't going away. So, um, what they did is they uh, conducted two conditions in a pairwise, condi uh, in a pairwise comparison. They ran a social escape condition, which might look like if this is where the person is, I might, I might not even say anything, or I might say something, and I'll just stand in close proximity, and then contingent on problem behavior, I'm going to remove myself from their personal space. Um, and many of you have probably worked with clients who um, will engage in problem behavior when um, people are quite close to them. So what's interesting here is that the no interaction condition serves as a control condition. And that seems odd, right? Because usually we think of the no interaction condition as a test for automatic reinforcement. But if you think about it, and that's where um, understanding the structure of functional analysis is important, is in the social escape condition, the EO that you're presenting is proximity. So that's the only thing you're really testing. So in the control condition, all you have to do is create an AO, like the complementary AO. So that would be not getting it near there, like um, maintaining a certain distance from them and not getting in close proximity. We don't need to do toys. We don't need to provide attention because that's not what we're really testing here. What we're really testing is proximity and how it has an effect on behavior. So really we just need to manipulate that one variable. We don't need to add in all of these other procedures because again, the, the toy play and the attention was evoking problem behavior anyway. So sometimes the conditions, like an alone condition, can actually function as a control condition. It just really depends on the context and the use. So um, what's the interpretation here for the, for the graph? What's behavior maintained by? Escape from so attention or proximity. Um, it depends on what, you know, it could be a verbal thing, like a vocal verbal thing, or it could be a, like a proximity, like in someone's personal bubble. You know how people have different personal bubbles? Well, um, they may not have the communication skills to let people know. That kind of makes me feel uncomfortable and maybe to back up. They might have learned when I hit someone, they, they back up. And that's a natural response, right, for us to do that. So then what they did is they basically just ran um, baseline, which was um, escape from social interaction, and then they implemented FCT where they taught the person to basically um, exchange an FCT card for, um, to get access to or to um, um, get escape from social interaction. Now certainly, you know, this is great. You can turn it on and off in behavior, and we know this is basically verifying the function. But it's certainly not acceptable for this person to just always escape social interaction because they're going to come in contact with um, people in um, everyday settings all the time. But this is certainly a starting point. So at that point, you might end up doing some demand fading where you increase the amount of time that they have to engage with somebody um, in a conversation or um, determine what a, a reasonable personal space bubble is and then um, getting to the point where the therapist can um, just be outside of that bubble and still maintain low levels of problem behavior. So this is just a start, and then we work toward getting to more clinically significant results once you've basically um, gotten control over the problem behavior and increased some kind of appropriate communication response for getting a break. Because usually if somebody gets a little close to me and I feel uncomfortable, I'm just gonna <laughs> slightly do it or you know sometimes you'll get the like body turn where it maybe feels like you have more personal space when really somebody is so close and some people feel quite cl um, uh, uh, feel uh, more comfortable um, when they're closer versus um, kind of being farther away so it's, it's more of a personal one okay so now we're going to talk a little bit about some considerations and also some safety precautions and really um, I'm giving you kind of the safety precautions that are for more severe problem behavior, just some things to think about. Again, you may not come in contact with clients to engage in the severe problem behavior, but I still want to kind of give you some ideas about uh, some variables to consider depending on the kinds of behavior that you are assessing. So we're going to talk a little bit and touch on um, these considerations, and then we're also going to touch on these considerations. So in terms of uh, safety precautions, there are a lot of different ways I've conducted a number of functional analyses and there are a lot of different ways that you can protect the therapist and also protect the client. Again, uh, a lot of this is based on um, really severe problem behavior. 
So if you have a client who engages, engages in really severe self-injurious behavior, that might involve something like eye poking that has resulted in a detached retina in the past, or um, ear uh, punching or ear slapping that has resulted in ear damage, um, those kinds of behaviors. Um, you can still assess the behavior, but you might assess a um, precursor behavior to that more intense self-injurious behavior, or you might also block the behavior. So we can still measure instances of behavior without letting them have their full impact. So for example, I know when I took my first applied behavior analysis course with um, Dorothy Lorman, she was, uh, she reported a little bit about her work with Iwata, and she was talking about a client that had basically head hit so much that the bone had actually deteriorated and the, um, like her brain was actually exposed. Um, and so uh, it was a very complex case. And so basically they did a functional analysis where somebody was behind a um, client and ready to block with like padding. And then they would start the functional analysis condition and they would um, uh, allow one behavior to happen and block it and then transition immediately to a control condition. So they were basically looking at a latency type of functional analysis where they're just looking at how much time does it take to evoke the behavior rather than running a full five minute session where we're um, observing multiple instances potentially of a behavior. So there's lots of ways that you can block problem behavior um, and there's lots of protective equipment. How many of you use protective equipment sometimes when you work with clients? Yeah, so you may be familiar with that. So um, in terms of the therapist, it might be things like Kevlar sleeves, or if you're working with like spitting, it's a good idea to use spit guards because it just helps with staff morale when they're actually conducting the assessment. And it's also more sanitary and um, reduces the issues of like communicable diseases and things like that. Um, you can also use martial arts padding on therapists so that um, it buffers the, um, the effect of hitting and things like that. And then also with the clients that you're working with, depending on um, the situation, they might be prescribed a helmet. Have any of you worked with clients that have like a prescribed helmet by a doctor? Yes, so some of you have. Um, in that situation, if the um, helmet or some other protective equipment is prescribed, you want to make sure that you have that device on when you're conducting the functional analysis. There was actually a really bad ethics case um, with somebody I'd actually worked with in the past. Um, not very closely, but I knew of them who worked at the same institution. And the client had a, um, a prescribed helmet. And um, in the research, it shows that if behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement, if you assess with a helmet um, and they're headbanging and it's maintained by automatic reinforcement, um, you might not uh, get as high rates. It might be a little bit more difficult to assess. But we're willing to accept that. That's just something that we have to accept and then continue to try to assess. So um, what he did instead was he removed the helmet based on kind of the research. So there's a difference between following the research exactly and then understanding about the research and then learning how to use it to work um, the, the best for your client and maintain safety for your client. So the moral of the story is if there's some kind of protective equipment that's used, just keep it in the functional analysis and, and make sure. Um, I've also worked with clients who have had really intense face punching. Um, one client that I worked with had punched his face so many times that he had broken his nose eight times and his um, nasal passage was just enormous. It was basically completely flattened out and had no structure. Like basically the bone was just, there was absolutely no structure in his nose. So um, when he came in, he was also on 15 different medications to try to control his behavior. And the psychiatrist that took over the case said that it was a very scary combination of meds. So what we did is we actually did a functional analysis for a while and then started reducing the medications to try to um, tweeze it out. So we used the functional analysis as a baseline, and then we worked with the psychiatrist to take out medications to look at its effect on behavior. Um, because his behavior was so intense, um, I could not physically block his punching. He was that strong. So um, we did use protective equipment in the form of splints because it prevented him from being able to punch his face. And because he was so strong, the damage that could potentially be done outweighed the potential use of the splint. So we had to take them off every two hours, and we had to follow safety protocols, but those are some things that you can use. Like a, a, another client of mine um, did have uh, splints for a while, and then we were able to reduce it. So there's usually like these little um, inserts that kind of make it more or less rigid, and you can reduce the inserts over time and kind of fade out the splints over time. 
Um, we could talk about protective equipment for two hours and uh, easily um, have more to talk about. Okay. So there are also other considerations. So if you've got a client that engages in really disruptive behavior, I had um, one time a, a, um, an individual that would throw chairs. Um, that is very dangerous to staff members and it's very dangerous to the client. And so in some situations, you can actually modify the spaces that you're going to use to assess to actually bolt the um, furniture down to the, um, to the um, foundation. And um, there are uh, major research institutions that specialize in problem behavior that have these kinds of setups because it's very dangerous to have a table that can move around a room when you've got a client that engages in really severe problem behavior. You may have seen things like uh, padded uh, walls or, or padded um, floor, and that's for individuals who might engage in severe self-injurious behavior. Um, and then also, uh, I remember we used to have this little clinical space at Western Michigan University, and we mostly did interviews with caregivers and other family members in that room, but it had like a really nice picture on the wall and things like that. And um, I remember like a new therapist uh, went to go run a functional analysis and kept that on there, and then the client went to go take the um, picture off the wall. And then obviously they had to terminate the session and clean out the room and make sure everything was out. But just definitely kind of keep that in mind that you, if you have an item in the room, it it basically makes it vulnerable where they're going to start to engage with that item, and then you're going to be in a position of do I take it away or do I not? And then you, now it's you're not running the functional analysis at that point. Um, I remember the first times, I, a couple times I had to run functional analysis. It was uh, with children with ADHD, and um, it was at a summer camp, and there was just like this little tiny ledge on the windows that was like actually quite short, and they would kind of get on it and, and scale it, and they'll just like in those kinds of conditions, they will find the item that you don't want them to engage in, and then they'll start engaging in it, and so try to preempt that and, and get everything over there. Um, I mentioned before another safety precaution is you don't need to wait until the most severe problem behavior happens in order and include that behavior in the functional analysis. If there are behaviors that are um, reliably perceived the problem behavior and don't happen um, at other times, then um, that's probably a precursor behavior and they've shown that you can do a functional analysis on the precursor behavior. So for example, if you've got a kid that might um, face slap they might do like an intense rubbing on their face right before they slap it. So you do a functional analysis on the intense rubbing instead of the face slapping because it um, reduces the intensity of the behavior and you can still get good assessment results. Um, I also wanted to mention if any of you have questions, you should just jump in. You don't need to wait until the end because if you're thinking it, other people are probably thinking it. So feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, there are other things that um, are general considerations when you're doing a functional analysis. Again, some of this is really related to severe problem behavior. But you want to determine um, a termination criteria for um, ending the functional analysis condition. And this is really when you're talking about severe aggressive behavior or um, self-injurious behavior. So if it's SIB, then you should probably ask a medical professional. Um, a lot of times we find that very helpful when we're working with clients that engage in head banging. They're already engaging in a lot of headbanging in their natural environment, but it's when we assess how many headbangs are tolerable within a day. Um, and then also what happens is like you do after each functional analysis condition, you check, um, you, you um, actually do like a skin check and you, and you make sure that they don't have any kind of contusions. Again, usually they're wearing a helmet anyway and they're using full padding. So typically um, with uh, headbanging, uh, the impact of the behavior is actually pretty minor. Also determining a protocol for emergencies in case they happen. I can kind of think about this um, when looking at um, intense food refusal and looking at pediatric feeding disorders. Um, usually you need, to do, you need to do a swallow study for clients like that that have complete um, total food refusal to make sure that they're safe swallowers. But if they aspirate, for example, when you're doing a feeding session, what's the plan? Um, usually you want to do those kinds of sessions in a hospital so that you have that, um, those uh, people that are trained to handle that right, uh, available right away. Um, also, you need, uh, if you're the one that's supervising the uh, functional analysis, it's really important to closely monitor uh, staff members to make sure that they're implementing the program correctly because really the data that are yielded from the functional analysis are only good, as good as the implementation of the functional analysis. And then also anticipating issues before um, they come to fruition. Again, it's like removing all of the furniture from the room or um, 
you know, like I typically don't like to do a functional analysis with a room that doesn't have the electronic locks because one thing that you could do is start the session and then bolt immediately from, like the child could bolt from the room. In fact, usually when I'm doing um, trainings for functional analysis, the first thing I'll do is I'll start the session and then I'll walk out of the room to see what they do because kids do that all the time or individuals do all that all the time. So if I don't have access to an electronic lock, I usually try to position myself right in front of the door so that contingent on going to the door, I don't have to walk toward it. So that now it's like this um, contingency game with the client where I'm trying to block them from getting out of the room and things like that, and just try to preempt it. Um, and I'll talk to you about a couple of other ways that you can do that um, throughout the presentation. Okay. So uh, one question also is wh who's gonna do the functional analysis and where? Um, and the data are kind of mixed. I think it probably depends on the client, and that's the reason why um, the analysis exists, is that we have individualized treatment. So it makes sense that um, it probably varies by person. But there are differences sometimes in the data when a familiar caregiver runs a functional analysis compared to a novel staff member that they don't have a long history with. And also the setting seems to play a role. So sometimes um, you might get a lot of um, uh, the school might have more reliably evoked behavior or maybe in a home setting, um, and you might not see it as often in a clinical setting, for example. So I'm gonna just show you a little bit of data um, that supports this. So the sessions are along the x-axis, and then the um, aggressive behavior and property destruction is along the y-axis. And so they conducted an initial um, functional analysis in the clinic with staff members, and they were rotating between um, attention um, toy play and demand, and this is not good. You know, <laughs> we don't we don't like this because you know there's nothing to analyze, right? It's just basically what we know. The, the the one piece of information that we have is that conducting a functional analysis with staff in the clinic does not sufficiently evoke behavior. Um, but that's not terribly helpful. So then they conducted um, the functional analysis in the clinic with the um, caregiver, and they were able to evoke a little bit of behavior in the um, demand condition. Um, and then and also in the attention condition a little bit. And then they did uh, staff versus caregivers in the clinic, and then here you get uh, uh, the demand condition is sufficiently evoking behavior by the caregiver, um, but when the demands are uh, presented by the staff, um, they're not getting that uh, behavior. Now, I have seen things like this, and I suspect that these staff members were probably really well trained, and that if you had done this at the beginning, when they first came to the clinic or started receiving services, I bet you get something that's more like this, right? This is probably an effect of following through with demands and not providing escape and also providing breaks um, after a reasonable amount of time and things like that. Um, similarly here, we get um, a little bit of behavior in the tangible and demand, and I would argue that if you had stopped here and you had um, made this y-axis go to four, that it's interpretable. Um, but it's still pretty low, so they did um, a caregiver in the clinic and they got way more behavior um, during the tangible condition. And then they conducted, um, uh, they looked at it with staff in the clinic. Does anybody know, this is kind of um, odd here, we've got toy play conditions here, and then this is um, demand, and then this is uh, tangible. Does anybody know kind of, this is kind of a design, does anybody know what that design is? It's a pairwise design. So really what you're doing is you're looking at the difference. You're not looking at the difference between um, the demand condition and the tangible. What you're looking at is demand is high compared to this toy play, and tangible is high compared to this toy play. So it's like a pairwise comparison where you're uh, comparing the test and the control, and you're doing it one function at a time. Sometimes that's a good way to go, especially if you're worried about a client differentially responding in the presence of five different conditions. Sometimes that can be um, difficult. And you can do things like using colors that are correlated with the different conditions. They have some studies that have looked at that. Um, in their study, they use different colored rooms. We don't have that kind of control, so you can do things like a therapist might wear like a little colored lay, or they might wear a colored um, uh, shirt or something like that. Um, and again, these data are, are very similar, so I'm not going to go into them too much. But again, the point is, is that um, these different settings or people can have... So um, if it doesn't work out at first, it might be important to kind of go back and look at 
what are those conditions that evoke behavior and are they being mimicked in these conditions? And if not, how do you make those adjustments to make them more similar to how um, the problem behavior happens in the, in the, um, in the community? Okay, so um, as all of you are probably aware, it's really important to have um, a BCPA that has formal supervision around functional analysis um, so that uh, you can have really high quality supervision when, and that will help to maintain the client's safety and it will um, increase the likelihood that you'll get good results that you can act on to develop a treatment. Um, you also want to make sure um, not all functional analyses are created the same. So um, conducting a functional analysis with a child that has a pediatric feeding disorder, failure to thrive, and total food refusal is very different than conducting a functional analysis on screaming. And there are so many more things that go into it. So even if you learn how to do a functional analysis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can do any kind of functional analysis. So really when you're being supervised, you want to get uh, a wide range of experience around conducting functional analysis, and you also want to make sure that you stay within that. So, for example, with self-injurious behavior, there are some biological contributions to SIB with some populations. So, for example, um, Lesch-Nye uh, syndrome <coughs> is associated with eye poking. Um, those individuals that are um, born with that genetic disorder called lesh -Nye are much more likely to develop eye poking over their lifetime. So there's a biological component and there's also an environmental component. So all of those factors are really important to consider when you're um, assessing and treating that behavior. And there are other genetic disorders that are associated with different forms of SIB. Um, I also forgot to mention, remember I was talking about the padding and all that, you might have noticed that I had asterisks by different points. You'll notice that in the presentation. I did want to point out that the reason why I put asterisks there is because it usually requires consultation with another field, like medicine or um, speech language pathology is um, often useful for pediatric feeding disorders and so forth, so sometimes some external consultation is needed in um, different fields. Um, Um, we also use different kinds of experimental designs to um, conduct a functional analysis. So if you're conducting two or more um, conditions, you can definitely use a pairwise comparison or a multi-element design. Um, if there are problems with differential responding, one thing you can do is um, a brief couple of control sessions, as long as that's low. You can go to a test condition and then reverse back to control, and then go to a different test condition and then reverse back to control. So there's lots of different options. And then I talked about this at BC ABBA, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but there are different styles of functional analysis. So there's the 90-minute model that's described by Northup et al. that is part of Dave Wacker's clinic um, in Iowa that does um, a brief functional analysis and then a contingency reversal to identify potential treatments. And then um, there are also studies that have looked at latency-based functional analysis where you're only um, looking at one instance of behavior per condition. This is often useful for clients who engage in severe problem behavior or for behaviors that are really not tolerable to like, continue to go on. I would love to do latency-based um, functional analysis for elopement because it's a lot easier than having to run after them. <laughs> I did an elopement study in July in, in, um, in uh, Louisiana and it was, it was uh, challenging. It was outside and it was very hot. Um, so latency-based would probably be great for elopement. Um, and then also trial-based functional analysis, which have often been used in classroom contexts and have been very effective. And they've done um, staff training or teacher training studies that have looked at teaching um, teachers how to implement trial-based functional analysis in classrooms, which is really cool. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Well, I'm going to go into the meat of the presentation, which is really talking about the test conditions and the control condition. So there are a variety of different functions that you could potentially assess during a functional analysis, and these are probably the main ones. So you're looking at different forms of social positive reinforcement, social negative reinforcement, and then also automatic reinforcement. Um, automatic reinforcement can be positive or negative, but I'm going to talk a little bit um, in a while where we really can't definitively say whether it's positive or negative automatically reinforced behavior, but we can um, gather, we can kind of assume that based on some assessments that we do. And I'll talk a little bit about that within the context of PICA. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the attention condition. For some reason, this is my favorite condition. I don't know. I think that um, before being trained as a behavior analyst, like when I had dogs, 
my 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 inter, like my natural reaction would probably be to attend the behavior. I'm less likely to provide escape, but I'm probably without training more likely to. My kids would probably have attention maintained problem behavior if I was untrained, as I guess what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I do love to um, conduct the attention condition. It is a fun one. Um, but there are different kinds of considerations. So. How are we going to create or contrive some kind of establishing operation to evoke attention maintained behavior? And then also, who's going to be the one to provide the attention? So sometimes it can be a peer um, with appropriate safety precautions. Sometimes it could be a parent, it could be um, a staff person. And then also the types of attention that you might provide. So have any of you worked with the kind of client where um, you go, whoa, good job, and then they go, mm -hmm. what that means? that volume is aversive, high volume is aversive. Good job! That's not reinforcing, it's aversive. They want it to go away. So that form of attention, um, having like a um, like volume um, with praise statements is not a reinforcing component of attention. Um, I've also worked with individuals where saying something like, oh, you're doing great, is not reinforcing, but providing them with a reprimand is actually more reinforcing than providing praise. Or it might be that like giving them a pat on the back or like kind of, you know, giving them like a chummy kind of uh, hug is more reinforcing than um, saying something to them or, or other forms of attention. So those are all kind of things that we're gonna talk about a little bit. So there are different ways that you set up the antecedent to an attention condition. Um, and all of these variations, um, they kind of are endless. And the thing you might wonder, well, how do I figure out what variation to do? And this is where interviewing the caregivers is very important. Um, I typically do like a one to one and a half hour interview with a family about the different topographies of problem behavior, the previous um, treatment attempts, and what they're currently doing now, um, what their preferences are about how they, you know, what, what their day looks like and things like that. Um, I do very little direct observation. I might do it for a snippet of time, but the only reason why I'm doing it is to really so that I can define the behavior. Um, I would rather spend an hour doing the functional analysis than an hour doing um, just, uh, just observing the behavior because really I'm only looking at how do people respond to behavior. I'm not at all assessing what the function of behavior is when I'm doing a direct observation. So um, you kind of want to get a sense of the context in which problem behavior occurs. And sometimes this can be challenging to get from families because they might think, you know, have you ever had the family that where it comes out of the blue? Like it, all, it happens for no reason. Have any of you worked with families like that? Yeah, and we know as behavior analysts that behavior doesn't happen out of the blue and it doesn't happen for no reason. Um, but that sometimes it can be very d difficult to detect those environmental variables that evoke behavior, or maybe they only evoke behavior every once in a while. So it can be quite challenging for families to identify those situations. And so that's why if you do get an ambiguous result, the first thing to do is to go back to the people that spend a lot of time with that client to get more information about it. But you might have families that report, you know, it's usually okay, but it's anytime I'm making dinner or anytime I'm on, the call, on a call with my sister or whoever it is, that's when it seems to evoke behavior. Um, and so if that is happening, then you wanna set up a condition where you'll say something like, I need to make a phone call play with this moderately preferred toy, not that you would say that language, but play with this moderately preferred toy while I pretend like I'm on the phone. And then you're going, oh yeah, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then if they engage in the problem behavior, they say, stop doing that. Um, I'm on the phone. Um, you need to give you know, me some space. The, um, so you kind of want to look at the different contexts when behavior happens and then try to mimic that as much as possible. Sometimes that doesn't sufficiently evoke behavior, and really the EO is more about two people interacting with each other. So it might be like a teacher talking to another student, and that seems to evoke behavior on the part of the student. Or it might be two, like the, um, the therapist and the mother talking, or the father talking, and that seems to evoke problem behavior. So you want to identify those things and then, um, and then set those up during the um, analysis. The other thing is that the reinforcing value of attention can be affected by the people that provide it. So attention from my grandmother is going to be a lot more, like a hug from my grandmother is going to be reinforcing, more reinforcing than probably anybody in this room. And I'm sure that all of you give really good hugs. I'm sure you do. But I have a history with my grandmother, so her hugs are more reinforcing to me than for, for other people. Um, so the, the attention can uh, be affected by the person that's delivering it. I've worked with people who have um, a particular gender preference. So they might like to uh, work with um, women, and when they work with men, it seems to evoke behavior, or you might get the opposite. Um, here are some data. Here again, most of these graphs
graphs are set up the same. So if the sessions were on the x-axis and then the percentage of intervals in which problem behavior occurred is on the y. And here, I'll just kind of show you what they did is they conducted a functional analysis in the classroom. And um, here you've got peer retention, and that's evoking behavior, um, an unacceptable amount of intervals probably from the perspective of the teacher. <laughs> right? This is a lot of behavior that's happening, and this is when the peer is delivering the attention, which happens all the time. You know, you get the person that kicks the back of the chair, you know, that happens all the time. Um, and then this is when the teacher provides attention. It's not, that's actually, that might even be functioning as a punisher. <laughs> Reprimands are, are not um, at all containing behavior. And so then they went into like a, a treatment analysis where they looked at DRO um, with, uh, that was delivered by peers. But mostly I just want to talk to you about the effect of the therapist. And they've done other things, like they've looked at um, the evocative effect of like a male therapist versus a female therapist during functional analysis and other types of variables. So again, it's about asking the right questions during the interview to get the information that you need so that you can set up these conditions properly. One of my favorite things to talk about are components of attention that affect behavior. And I think this is because um, this was one of the first research studies that I participated in as an undergraduate research assistant. And I can remember finally conducting these sessions and it was really, really fun. So um, as I mentioned before, there are different components of attention. So it might be something about the, the like something somebody said. So it might be like, uh, like for adults, it might be validation. Like, yeah, that's unfortunate. Like I, I would be upset too. That kind, that might be a form of attention, um, or it might be more like eye contact. So I've worked with parents that kind of give the stink eye. So like when their kid does something, they're like, and that might actually be enough to maintain behavior. Um, now I think the goal is to have the stink eye function as a punisher, but in some kids it actually is the opposite. Um, also physical attention, and I've worked with clients that have had really severe self injurious behavior. And one of the things to maintain their safety during an emergency situation is actually to physically contain their body in a basket hold. Um, and it's done in a very specific way to maintain their safety, and it's done by people who are trained to do it. But one of the things that can happen that's really, um, and this was more of an emergency procedure, but one of the things that can happen is that physical attention can actually function as a reinforcer. And so sometimes I've actually seen clients that will engage in problem behavior to be restrained. And um, that's, again, the physical contact of it is reinforcing. Similarly, I mean, the, the um, have it, do any of you do martial arts? Well, so that contact is reinforcing to some individuals. So roughhousing and like kind of wrestling is not topographically that far off from a less than ideal situation where somebody's engaging in a lot of problem behavior and there's an attempt to kind of contain their body. They're, they are physically very similar. So it's unsurprising Typically, developing adults enjoy that kind of interaction, and so do some um, kids. Um, also, different kinds of gestures and facial expression. So it might be, I've, I've worked with clients where it's enough to just go with problem behavior. Um, or um, I worked with a, a client that had really severe attention maintained problem behavior, and it you could do kind of um, any kind of response in relation to problem behavior, and that would be enough of attention. So if you were in the middle of a conversation with you, if he was in the middle of a conversation with you and he um, hit me, for example, I know I'm changing uh, uh, pronouns, but if he hit me and I stopped talking to him, that change from going to talking to him to stop talking to him, that was enough of an acknowledgement that the behavior happened to evoke a bunch of problem behavior. So you'd think that withdrawing attention for attention maintained problem behavior would reduce it because really what you're doing is a contingent timeout. But it was the reaction, that shift in the environment, the change in the environment based on the problem behavior that was enough to maintain problem behavior. Um, here are some functional analysis uh, data, and these are the data that were obtained. Um, I conducted some of these sessions, so it's pretty fun. Um, so these are the initial uh, functional analysis results, and you can see that attention is high um, compared to toy play, which is here. But then what they did is they evaluated reprimands, unrelated comments, so it would be like, it's sunny out when they would give you, which is kind of weird. Um, tickles, eye contact, praise, and then um, physical attention, like pats on the back, 
And um, there were, you can see, some components of attention more reliably evoked problem behavior than other forms of attention. So it was um, reprimands for the most and then tickles, which, yeah. That could easily get shaped. Anyone? Can you just ask two questions? Do you think that restriction, physical restriction, can function in, in a way as a, as a reinforcer? I was thinking okay. that I, I observed we had this chat because this uh, client was severely, but severely engaging in, in self injurious and she was admitted in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of the service. But uh, she was being restrained in the hospital, four points restrained. And then when they tried to release us, she would hit until mm -hmm. she was restrained again. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they would immediately restrain her and she would hit and hit and hit. Right. But severely, I mean, severely mm -hmm. hit. Eyes, uh, ears, uh, nose. Mm -hmm. So it's unsurprising that they would do something like that given the kind of damage. But what's probably happening, unfortunately, is that you know the the um, you know the restraints may be reinforcing, mm -hmm. but also what kind of environment is somebody in? It's a pretty depleted environment. Yes. So um, you know you can't just take off the restraints. It's also about enriching the environment so that they have lots of different kinds of sources of reinforcing stimuli. Um, right now, they're probably in um, the mode of just trying to prevent that from happening, yeah, but it's yes. really not um, moving beyond that and actually getting uh, that person into a therapeutic environment and um, getting the restraints taken off and actually getting them. Yeah, why did we just suggest this opportunity without mm -hmm. medication? Yeah, but they understand that it's coming from a place of caring. It's mm -hmm. just that um, they probably don't have enough skills to mm -hmm. figure out how to, like, how to address that. And they're probably doing the best they can. And unfortunately, when we are trained to deal with severe problem behavior, that's often what happens. And I do think I think it's great that you all are showing up because I really love to see more people utilizing this because um, it can really be helpful for um, very simple cases as well as very complex cases. So um, my point here is that different forms of attention can function as reinforcers. So when I'm doing the interview, if they say, yeah, I think that they kind of do it for attention. One thing I'll do is I'll try to observe an instance of behavior. Like I'll try to observe that interaction between the caregiver and the, and the child. And I will basically make a mental note of what the quality of it was like. So if it's SIB, I find typically it's more soothing. It's more like, honey, don't do that. You're gonna hurt yourself. Oh my gosh, you're making me so worried. Please don't do that. You're gonna hurt yourself. I'm, you know, mommy, dad, so worried, blah, blah. If it's aggression, it's not usually that tone. Yeah, it's it's usually stop it. Don't do that anymore. So the topography often does affect the quality of the attention that people provide. Um, because when you see somebody engage in self-injurious behavior, it makes us, I mean, I know I get upset. It's not something I like to see. And that's why I love what I do, because I am there to make that not happen anymore. Um, but um, what I do try to do is get the quality. And if I can't see it between the caregiver and the client, usually I'll get the um, the caregiver or the person that spends a lot of time with them to act it out. So I'll just say, I'll engage in the topography, not really, but I'll pretend, I'll be like, okay, I just hate you. Now you pretend, what does it look like to show me it? And that's how I'll do it in the functional analysis. So my attention isn't always a reprimand. It might be more of like a soothing statement. So I usually try to just mimic exactly what the caregiver does if I'm the one that's running the functional analysis. This is a potential way to look at um, this was published by um, Eileen Roscoe's lab. Um, I can't remember the first author. I think it's, <coughs> I can find out for you. But Eileen Roscoe's definitely on the authorship. And what they did is they used a social stimuli questionnaire and they just asked caregivers to write these different types of stimuli. So they looked at physical um, attention with contact, like um, swinging somebody around, or giving somebody like a high five or something like that. Um, physical with no contact. And then also verbal, like reprimands and, and things like that. So they just um, basically were trying to find out what are some of these, um, how often do they come in contact with these kinds of social stimuli, and that might give you a little bit of idea of some components that may or may not be reinforcing. Any questions about that? Okay, so the tangible condition. Um, this is where you're setting up a condition where you have um, some kind of deprivation or withholding of uh, tangible items and then contingent on problem behavior, you deliver those tangible items. 
but there are some different ways that you can um, set up the antecedent and also ways that you can set up the consequence that look a little bit different. So oftentimes what happens is the client is allowed to engage with the tangible item for a period of time. Now what happens if we give it to them for 10 minutes? Yeah, so we're going to create an AO for tangibly maintained behavior. That might be a good treatment, but what we're doing is assessing, so we don't want to do that. So you're going to give it to them for a brief period of time, like 30 seconds, a minute, no more than two, I would say. And then you're going to remove it. Now, um, there are variations with the removal. So um, sometimes you might just say, um, you just might take it away and put it, oh, like, you know, take it away and then put it away, like in some kind of cabinet, and be like, it's not time to do that right now. Um, and then if they engage in the problem behavior, you will give it back to them. You might just also hold it. Another thing that you can do is interact with the item. So I find um, this mimics more like what a toy play or like a play conditions look like in school settings where um, you might have a kid that's playing with the item that the child wants and um, is likely to engage in problem behavior to get access to. Um, so you, you might need to actually play with it. And people say, oh, that's me. Like, you can't play with it in front of them. And, but um, this happens all of the time in educational settings, and it's really important to see if that evokes problem behavior, because if it does, and it happens at school, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna be a lot more of a problem than if they're hitting adults. Um, at least that's been my experience with schools. It's usually more of a problem if they're hitting other kids than if they're hitting another adult, although all of them are problematic. Um, and then also, this might seem counterintuitive, but also saying something when you remove the toy. Now, what? My turn. Yeah, yeah, my turn. Um, or I've said, it's my turn with that right now. Um, or I've also said, you can't have that right now. And um, you might wonder kind of why you would say something. So one thing that we do know about the tangible function is that you only want to assess it if it's indicated. Because if you assess it and it's not indicated, it's very easy to shape up a tangible function. So if somebody gives me contingent video games based on saying expletives, I'm going to be saying expletives all the time so I get, ex um, I get access to video games. Uh, but that doesn't mean that my problem behavior is maintained by access to video games. Nobody gives me video games contingent on problem behavior, honestly. Um, so the way that people take away items looks different. So some parents might do the kind of um, yeah, sweetie, um, one more minute, it's time to take away the toy, like, can you give it to me? And there's this, like, kind of back and forth debate about whether or not the toy is going to end up with the family. Um, sometimes it's just to take it away and that's the end of it. Um, and so I actually conducted where the tangible function was indicated, but we were not able to evoke problem behavior because normally in a tangible condition, I just take it away and don't say anything. That's the kind of base, that's the, the standard fair tangible condition that I might run. And it wasn't evoking behavior, but it was indicated by the family as, as like a, a, an absolute thing. Every time they take away this video game, he was engaging in problem behavior. So we said, oh, do you do anything? And they go, no, we so say, you can't have that right now. You can't have that, bam. I, could, I didn't even have to finish the sentence, and it was immediately evoking the behavior, which, do, does anybody know my lab? <laughs> my students in my lab should know this, so I won't answer. But does anybody know, like, saying something like, you can't have that right now? How is that functioning? What's the, what's the concept and principle? How might that acquire properties? You can't have that right now. It's correlated with taking away an item. It's an antecedent to behavior. So you're talking controlling variables like SDs, S deltas, warning stimuli, or you're talking CEOs, conditioned establishment operations. Okay, it's a conditioned establishment operation. <laughs> and it's a surrogate conditioned establishment operation, probably, which means that the removal of the item is the aversive event. That's an establishing operation, it's probably another CEO because usually removing video games doesn't evoke problem behavior on infants. We have a learning history that develops that. Uh, we take it away, but it's also correlated with the presentation of it's my turn. And so um, it could be a, a reflexive CEO where it's signaling the worsening of a condition, or it could be a surrogate where that um, verbal statement has been paired with the removal of the item. But either way, 
Um, it's not just the removal of the item now, it's that statement and the removal of the item that's evoking behavior. And so we, we had to again go back and ask the family, okay, so how is it that you remove the item? And so we had to kind of observe that and we had to practice so that we could see what it looks like. Yeah? Do you think that sometimes when you remove the item or you when you present the demand, the response is not immediate and parents sometimes say, oh, but that's not immediate, it takes some minutes. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, oh, it's immediately, like you said, the minute you say, oh, yeah, it didn't happen mm -hmm. now, and the response is immediate. Should that depend more on the kind of history, and I'm thinking of schedule, that uh, maybe if it's that uh, we can see a cause, like, let me start there. Let's say that the toy, when you remove the toy, and this time, uh, it takes a little bit longer, but then the response comes two minutes or mm -hmm. one minute. I'm going to say engaging for the behavior, you give the toy sure. away, the behavior is tough. You remove the toy again, there's a pause, yeah. pause reinforcement, okay. and then. Yeah. And in order for, for the child, you remove the toy and immediately. You remove the toy and immediately the response. Should that depend on the, on the history of enforcement? Probably. I mean, you know, our behavior is a function of four things. Biology, past history, current context, and cultural. So it, in that context, it probably is a historical thing. And it might be that, um, you know, uh, there is a certain amount of time. Like, we know that with demands, it might not evoke behavior right away, but if we have them work for more than 15 minutes, it's likely to evoke problem either. So if they don't get access to it for five minutes, it might be fine, but it might be something like where you're more likely to get it. Maybe they yield, yield such a Well, yes, it, it definitely does when they don't have access to it. If that is a potential reinforcer. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, you might need to run some, like a trial-based functional analysis where you just wait for one instance and then you move on and you keep doing that so that you don't have to, because if it's taking two minutes to evoke the behavior, I would say you probably want to run like 10 minute sessions, but instead, if you're doing clinically, you might want to do a trial-based and you'll get the one behavior and you'll, you'll move on to the next thing and then, you know, and so then you're just, you're just waiting two minutes. Good question. Yeah. Are you not worried about like confusing the attention function if you're talking and negotiating as you're removing something? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's why I said it might seem counterintuitive. So we know that when we assess tangibles, we should do it only when it's indicated because we can get false positives. Mm -hmm. So we know that the act of giving something to somebody and taking it away can be a form of attention. And so we might get see a tangible function when really it's an attention function. The difference is that I'm saying something before the behavior's happening not contingent on the behavior happening. So it would be like, it's my turn. And they're gonna come hit me, Caitlin's gonna come hit me, and I'm gonna give it back to her. So it would be different than, um, you know, I'm doing this, she hits me, I go, oh, here you go. That's a problem. If you give it to them, you just wanna be like, not even look, I'm just like, and walk away. <laughs> so I try to minimize the amount of attention, and that's a really good question. I think the difference is the timing of it in relation to the problem behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 All right, escape from demands. Uh, we need to know about the types of tasks that evoke problem behavior if demands seem to be indicated in the interview. So not all demands are um, aversive. There might be specific types. So I've worked with clients where physical activity seems to be way more aversive than working on tasks. I've also gone into schools where kids have to do those like work independently for like up to an hour, like doing the activities in the bins. And I've noticed that that can be something that is quite aversive and can evoke problem behavior. But other activities that are more engaging and that involve um, kids in their class or their teacher's attention usually don't evoke problem behavior. And then I also mentioned just a few minutes ago that the amount of time that you spend on a task can influence whether or not you see problem behavior. So if you're running only five minute conditions and you're doing a demand condition, um, you might not get behavior, but everybody's indicating seems to be a problem. So then you might ask the teacher or the family, when you do work, how long are you doing it before you see this problem behavior? How long do they seem to be working just fine before? before it goes, um, uh, it becomes a problem. Um, so if you notice that duration is a factor, you're probably gonna have to change the way that you escape it. 
Um, there are different, the, I'm going to show you a couple of ways to identify uh, empirically demands that you can include in the functional analysis. You don't have to go this far, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you do this, but I just wanted to let you know it's out there and that there are methodologies for identifying um, task demands. But usually with a really good thorough interview with the people that spend a lot of time, you can figure out um, the types of demands. But again, sometimes it is very difficult to get information from other people, or you might be working with somebody where people don't have very much experience with them, and so this kind of assessment may be helpful. So what they did is, um, this is a double y-axis graph. So they have different task demands on the x-axis, and then they have the percentage of compliance along the, um, the primary y-axis, and that's indicated by the bars. And then they have the secondary y-axis, which is aggression, um, expressing aggression per minute. And that's indicated by the problem behavior here. So does anybody have an idea of um, what kinds of tasks might be reasonable to include in the functional analysis based on these data? We're looking for things that have low compliance and high problem behavior. Yeah, that's definitely one. Maybe zip-up jacket. Um, there's a little bit more compliance with throwing away the napkin, but there's a bunch of problem behaviors, so that might be reasonable too. But definitely something on this end, and less so on this end, right? Mm -hmm. You know what's really cool about this assessment, though, is that I know the compliance is really low with this, and it evokes problem behavior, but I know, hey, I got two tasks that don't evoke problem behavior and are high compliance. That's great. So you're not just running a functional analysis, you're actually looking at potential treatment options like interspersing high probability requests, which are these, and with these higher demands, to try to intersperse those more you know, those uh, more difficult demands that um, evoke problem behavior. But this, this gives you some information about what task demands don't evoke problem behavior or which ones are um, associated with high levels of compliance. So it actually can give more information than just how to design that thing. Here is another type of assessment that they used um, by Paul Pabico and Lomas. And um, they actually did this at the Marcus Institute where I used to work. And here are, again, tasks on the, um, on the x-axis. And then they have latency to response along the y-axis. So what they were looking at is when I present a demand, how many seconds does it take before I get a problem behavior? Because if you've got uh, behavior that's evoked with short latencies, that's probably a good one to include. But like you were talking about, if you have longer latencies to behavior, like two minutes, mm -hmm. we don't want to include that. But if it's in the tangible condition, that's the only tangible that people deliver, then you need to include it, and it's just something that you have to accept. But you can still find demands that evoke behavior quickly. Because, for example, um, here, so these, the gray bars show the individual sessions, the latency, and then these black bars show the average of those sessions within that um, particular demand. So with these demands, wiping the table pretty quickly evoked problem behavior, but with the, um, the receptive motor, um, it took a long time to evoke behavior, almost up to five minutes in some situations. So this situation here is problem behavior didn't happen because they're five minute conditions and this is 600 seconds. And that's kind of, so these graphs are a little bit different because normally when we talk about problem behavior, we associate high, meaning we don't want that. <laughs> but this is actually really good because this means that they're, um, they can tolerate this task for at least uh, four minutes before uh, problem behavior is likely. Whereas if they engage in wiping the table, it's going to evoke problem behavior within the first minute or the first two minutes. And then what they did was they did a follow-up functional analysis just to kind of further the point, which is when you include the um, less aversive task, it's more variable. And then really at the functional analysis, you're looking at the end. You're looking at the test conditions um, compared to the toy play conditions toward the end. And so this is not, um, these are kind of more difficult to interpret. So um, the demand, uh, that was included with the low latencies to problem behavior evoked behavior more readily. So if you were conducting the functional analysis and you only had this path and not this other one, it would be much easier to interpret the data. So um, again, this just um, further the point that including task demands that uh, are 
aversive is important, and that um, if you include the wrong task demands, you might not evoke sufficiently problem behavior, even though it is potentially a function. Um, I'll show you data from the first study that I ever helped out with. Um, but I thought it was really cool. Um, what we did is a, an experimental functional analysis with a six-year-old child with um, ADHD. And you can see that escape here is indicated and it's high compared to the toy play condition. So um, my advisor at the time, John Northup, was interested in different variations of um, how you might provide instructions during functional analysis, because that's something that you can potentially do. So what we did is we ran a demand condition here. These conditions are all demand conditions. They're all, there's no, really this is the control condition, but it's still a demand condition. So what we said here is, um, you can take a break. What we said here is, time out. But functionally, we we're still walking away from her and giving her a break. But what we said to her about that break influenced her behavior. So when we told her, you can take a break, that evoked a lot of behavior. But when we told her that it was time out, it did not. It actually functioned as a punisher because she engaged in a couple of responses. We said time out and, and basically gave her a break and uh, it stopped evoking behavior. So why do you think this is happening? Association. Somebody's implementing time out, yeah. probably properly. <laughs> you know, if it's going to have this kind of power, they're doing it right. <laughs> probably, if they're doing it incorrectly, they probably look more like this. <laughs> Excuse me. And then um, what we did is we stopped providing any instructions, and we just said nothing and gave her a break. Versus we continued to say time out and again. So what you say about uh, the consequences can um, sometimes have an, an impact. And so we want to think about their learning history. I used to work with a client, their learning history with different words and phrases. So I had this client where if you said good job, he would kick your butt. And he was 16 and much larger than me, and at least eight inches taller than me. And he um, would do things like try to kick out your knee, like really damaging behavior. So like, there are probably some reasons like where good job was correlated with less than ideal teaching practices so that something like that could kind of have an impact. But people say good job all the time. So, you know, one thing might be, well, just stop saying good job. Well, sure, but, you know, we go into the store and somebody says, like, oh, wow, you did such a good job in the store with your mom. Boom, you get a bunch of problem behavior. So um, something like that saying good job contingent on like uh, correct working could actually evoke problem behavior where if you said something like, wow, that's cool, it wouldn't evoke problem behavior. So um, just kind of keep those things in mind that learning history and their experience with the world absolutely comes to affect the way that the functional analysis turns out. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about escape from social interaction. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, I showed you that graph. Um, so there are different ways that you can set up that condition to assess escape for social interaction. And again, you might want to look at kind of what it looks like in the environment, but sometimes it might be something as easy as kind of getting in somewhat close proximity, but just continuously talking. Kind of like the yapper, like where there's just never, like there's never a pause. It's like, oh, how are you doing? Wow, it's such a nice day out. I can't believe it. I just worked out, blah, blah, blah. And you're just like going to continue to talk and just say all this stuff. Um, and then contingent on problem behavior, you're just going to stop talking. Um, or it might be something where you don't say anything at all, but let's say that this is the client, you might just walk up and kind of um, have your shoulder touch theirs. Or you might um, pat their back and kind of get close. The only thing that I would suggest if you do something like that and that behavior is aggression, is don't ever turn your back to a client that's engaging in aggression. I bet all of you know that and you've had that experience. Like, you know why not to do that? You've probably had some experience. But even here, um, when you're touching them, you need to be aware and kind of be ready to block because you are pretty close to somebody and um, it's hard to block when you're side by side with somebody compared to when you're facing them. Um, but I would not recommend walking up to a client and getting in their personal space in that way because from an outside perspective, it looks quite aggressive. Mm -hmm. It looks quite aggressive for a therapist to walk up to somebody and get into their personal space in a, like, in a head-on kind of direction. So if you're gonna do it, what I recommend is kind of getting more on the side. Um, but again, you need to do what evokes the problem behavior and what people feel comfortable with. So again, you get parent consent and things like that. Um, and so 
you just kind of need to do some negotiation around what's the physical proximity, how are we going to um, contrive that establishing operation to evoke uh, behavior that's maintained by getting away from people. Okay, so here are some graphs where they looked at that. It's by Harper and colleagues, a student of um, Brian Lewis. And these data look very similarly. Like the, kind of the classic telltale sign is when you get high levels of behavior during the toy play, that's usually a decent indication that it might be escape from social interaction. That's the first thing I would think. Um, whether that's true, you have to continue to assess, but that's usually the first thing. So then when they got this result, they immediately probably hypothesized, oh, uh, it's probably social demand. Um, and so then what they did was they looked at um, proximity. Um, so in all of these cases, what they, um, there were like ambiguous functional analysis results where different, um, like the, play, the toy play condition was reliably evoking behavior, sometimes the task demand, Right, because again, it's about somebody approaching the other person. Those different variables are evoking behavior, but that's not what the function is. They're not, they don't actually have control of the reinforcer in these conditions, and that's why they're not as, uh, you see how this is quite variable? But look at this. That is pretty consistent. That's pretty consistent. That's consistent. That's consistent. It's a little bit more consistent than what you have here, and the likelihood is that it's because they have control of the reinforcer here, but not here. Um, this is another example. Um, this is an interesting one, and I kind of talked to you a little bit about what people say has an impact. So they conducted this functional analysis. This is kind of like a womp, womp, womp. I would have, if I was doing this clinically, I would stop right here. <laughs> After the first, you know, one of every condition, they're like, nope, we don't have it. We, didn't, we don't know what's going on. We need to revisit, we need to talk to some more people. Same goes here. It's like, yeah, you get a little bit of a logical effect here in the attention condition. But it kind of, uh, it goes back down to zero. So these aren't entirely helpful data. Um, well, actually they are. Um, what we do know is that these conditions with zero levels of behavior don't evoke problem behavior. So if we run a demand condition, we run a toy, uh, tangible, we run attention, we run those conditions, it's a form of treatment. It is, it is resulting in uh, near zero levels of behavior. So even though it might not be the ideal treatment or the goal, we've already identified conditions in which we can um, have zero levels of behavior. So um, what they did was they talked to caregivers and um, it's kind of interesting. They were looking at escape from dump requests. So when kids are engaging in problem behavior, it's not usually about compliance. So if they're, you know, you know, doing something inappropriate with the uh, linens or something like that, or you know, doing something with the tablecloth, it would be more likely that they would say, don't do this, versus please come here. <laughs> Usually contingent on problem behavior, it's all about the don't. So um, what they did was they had um, a condition where they said, you know, don't do this, don't do this, and it was more about what they were doing at that moment, and it was just constantly saying, don't do this. And then contingent on problem behavior, they would stop saying that. And in the controlled condition, they just never said, don't do this. Interestingly, with Ike, they didn't do this. Researchers sometimes have a sense of humor. Um, and with Tina, um, they did the uh, don't request, which evoked behavior. But then they did the match do requests, which I think is really neat. So all of the ones that they said, don't do this, they found the complementary do version of it and presented that, but it didn't evoke behavior. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about making requests. It was about escaping the nagging, like the don't do this, don't do that. Like basically these kids were um, engaging in behavior to escape that kind of um, social interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different than proximity. It's more about getting away from the nag. Um, I mean like the nagging behavior, no, I'm not saying that as the person is the nag. But the, the <laughs> <nagging>. <laughs> um, Okay, so now we're going to talk about the alone, no interaction condition. And this is usually where there may or may not be a person present in the room. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how to choose. And then there are no materials that are present. And um, also there's no um, demands and there's no attention that's provided. And there are no program consequences for behavior. So if problem behavior happens, um, it's just, you know, you're gonna, um, if somebody's in the room, 
uh, they'll ignore it, and if somebody's not in the room, the session will just continue on until um, the session's over with them. Obviously, if there is a severe problem behavior and it's in a loan condition, there's some kind of termination criteria where it's like they can only engage in so many behaviors before you stop the session to maintain safety. We're not just doing loan conditions and letting kids engage in intense SIV for five minutes. That's not usually the way it works. Um, as you may know, the attention function really, you can't um, empirically identify an attention function. What we can say is that behavior persists in the absence of social consequences, but um, that indicates that there's some kind of automatic function. And it can be automatic positive reinforcement, so it might produce some kind of visual stimulation, or it might produce some kind of sound, and that um, when the behavior produces that kind of stimulation, it, it uh, reinforces the behavior and it continues. But it can also be automatic negative reinforcement, and I have worked with clients where we did think that that was going on. So we had a client that would engage in um, chin rubbing, and it was just constant chin rubbing. And he did it for long periods of time, and it was more of a durational thing. It wasn't, it was intense, but it was more about how often he did it and how long he did it. And so um, when he came into the uh, clinic, and this is a clinic for, a specialized clinic for intense severe problem behavior, but he basically had the first, I think, three layers of his skin were completely rubbed off because of this behavior. Now, all of us have had wounds, and what happens when we've got an open wound and it starts healing? Yeah. 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 But what's the effect? It itches, right? It totally itches because it, it's healing. And so when we have a scab, it usually itches and we want to scratch it. Or we want to now rub some more. So um, the behavior may have started for whatever reason, but we assume that it was probably because of some kind of automatic negative reinforcement which is like, you know, when we get a mosquito bite and it's itchy, we scratch it, and that's automatic negative reinforcement. Same thing goes, like he had, he was completely nonverbal, had no way to express pain or anything like that, which was an issue, that's one of the things we've worked on. But um, that skin rubbing is probably uh, producing some relief of the itching. So that's why we might talk about uh, automatic negative reinforcement. And then what we ended up doing is collaborating with um, Emory the School of Medicine, and they created this device that you could um, put on the skin, and it would um, promote healing, but it would also make it so that when he did rub, it basically took out the friction coefficient, so there was no resistance, and it basically just glided over. So eventually it healed up, and we were able to break the cycle, right? Because usually we break the cycle by, you know, looking at it and being like, I'm not gonna hit you, I'm not gonna hit you. <laughs> but he didn't have these types of skills, where I put a Band-Aid over it to block it, um, you know, with babies, when they are, new, you know, newborns, we usually uh, put something over their um, hands to prevent them from scratching their face. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's keep talking about the automatic function. So, it is really important not to provide attention. And this can get really complicated when you might have behavior that's maintained by both attention and automatic reinforcement. It can get a little bit... Um, complicated, and I'll explain a little bit about that right now, which is the distinction between how do you determine whether you do an alone condition or a no interaction condition. So does anybody have any idea on how you would decide that? Besides safety, that's the obvious one. Do you need another person to engage in SIV? No. Do you need another person to engage in aggression? So you can't test automatic reinforcement for aggression without another person present. Now usually, not always, we can never follow the exact rule, but typically aggression is maintained by some kind of social reinforcement. Social, like getting out of, um, interacting with people, getting out of work, getting attention. It's because when you hit somebody, people respond. I mean, can you imagine it being in the natural environment and then somebody hits you and not having any kind of response? Maybe some of us, because we're behavior analysts, but usually, <laughs> probably not, we're gonna respond, we're gonna be like, what are you doing, like, why are you hitting me? Um, so typically, aggression is social. However, I have worked with clients where aggression is maintained by automatic reinforcement. So one of the most interesting cases that I ever had was this kid who had uh, Cornelia Delay, and it is a genetic disorder, and um, when you have Cornelia Delay, you're really good, this is a genetic disposition, but you're very good at um, fine motor skills, incredibly good. So his like pincher um, task with the OT was like off the charts, but 
He was also his topography of aggression. Can anybody guess what it was? Pinching. It was pinching, unfortunately. <laughs> so he was really good at pinching. It was actually quite painful. So what he would do is he would just take this little bit, take the tiniest little bit, and he would rip it. So it wasn't really even like pinching. It was more like skin picking. Mm -hmm. um, so you might wonder, how is that maintained by automatic reinforcement? Really interesting thing. So we wondered the same thing. His dad had a blood disorder. And so when he would get hit, he would bruise really quickly and pretty, uh, it was very colorful. It had produced an immediate mark. And so the act of pinching produced that effect, that change in the environment, that the, the sight of the bruise. And in fact, his pinching was so bad that it would often produce blood, like in his family's home. And he would actually try to get the blood and engage in like, blood play, basically. Um, and so this was maintained by automatic reinforcement by getting access to the site of the bruise and then also potentially by um, uh, getting access to the blood to play with. So you might wonder how do you, how do you assess that? Um, so what we did is we had Kevlar sleeves and they recruited all of the people that bruise really easily. And I'm one of those people, so I was really lucky to run the first session. It was so fun. It was like the best assessment ever. Um, I ran the first condition, and I determined that the timeout criterion was 10 instances of picking because I couldn't, I couldn't be in the room for longer than 10 instances of behavior. It was so painful. I think the first time I did it, it was 15. I was like, nope, we got a timeout at, at 10. It's just not possible. So what we did is, to assess the automatic reinforcement, we, put, we, we wore turtlenecks. And we only had one slice of our arm exposed. The other arm was we had long sleeves and Kevlar sleeves. So there's only one little spot that was open. And then he would pick only on that spot. And then we would rotate which arm was exposed so that we could look at control. So we only got, any time it was exposed skin, that's when we got the pick. He wasn't pinching any other spots. So that kind of increased the likelihood that we could be a little bit more certain that it was actually, um, the, uh, the side of the bruise. Then we even got more detailed, so that was about the, um, the pinching part of it, but then we wanted to study the blood play. But they were like, okay, how do you do that? Well, luckily it was right around um, Halloween, and so they have all those fake blood things. And so we had like a little napkin, and we put a syringe of fake blood underneath it. And so when he would pinch us, we would just put it over us like we were wiping it, and then we would deposit like blood. And then he would, and then we would take data on duration of blood play. It's the weirdest um, <laughs> data punch because we did it on a computer and it was like blood play and then it was like you put on B for the duration and then you put on B to take the duration off. It was, it was very um, odd. So, <laughs> so um, it's really infrequent but sometimes aggression can be maintained by automatic reinforcement and if it is you need to make sure that you include a person. Well if it's aggression you need to include a person in that test. Um, sometimes you don't need to test uh, automatic reinforcement for aggression if it's not indicated. Um, one thing that I mentioned before is that if you've got a client with a tension maintained problem behavior, but you also suspect that it's also maintained by automatic reinforcement, you're going to be running an attention condition and you're probably going to be running uh, some kind of no interaction condition. Now, imagine a kid that's got a tension maintained problem behavior and I'm about to run a no interaction condition. And I'm going to sit here and basically not provide any attention. So we've got an EO for attention. And I'm not gonna provide any attention contingent on problem behavior. What am I functionally doing if the behavior is maintained by attention? Am I, I'm running in a low condition, but what am I really doing? I'm running attention extinction. So if you have multiply controlled behavior with attention and automatic reinforcement, or you, you assess automatic reinforcement because it's indicated but you're unsure, you might actually get really high levels of behavior during those first couple of conditions, but that's actually an attention extinction burst. Mm -hmm. And then if you continue to run those no interaction conditions, it'll actually reduce down to zero. So sometimes if you're running this in this situation, you need to first make sure you're not providing any t attention. Now, if somebody hits me, I could grimace, or like let's say I'm standing here and somebody goes to like whack me in the head. In a no interaction condition, I'm not gonna tell a therapist, you know, don't block, just let them hit you because you can't provide the reaction. That's totally unsafe. Of course they're gonna block. But if I, let's say I'm running a no interaction condition, every time they go to hit me, I do this to block. What am I now doing? 
I'm doing an attention condition with a component of attention. <laughs> That's basically what I'm doing. So um, it's really important to think about like what you're wearing. This would be completely inappropriate to wear during a functional analysis because one thing that could happen is if I'm ignoring them, they could lift up my skirt. I have to pay attention to that. So now I've just paid attention to the problem behavior when I'm trying to assess automatic reinforcement, but really I'm reinforcing problem behavior that's maintained by attention. So if you're in that situation, you really need to kind of think about it. And what I do is, if I think that it's maintained by attention, or I already have some data that suggests that, and I'm gonna do a no interaction condition, what I'll do is if I know I'm gonna have to block, I will position myself in the corner of a room where I have my back facing the room so I can see everything in front of me. I have, if I, if I don't have an electronic lock, I'll be in front of the door. If I do have an electronic lock, I'll be away from the door. And instead of contingently doing this, what I might do is this, and just stand there, like this, the whole entire time. So that if they do hit me, all I have to do is maybe that, to reorient, to get it. Whereas it's very different doing this, compared to this, every time somebody tries to hit you. So there are ways that you can um, still block behavior during that condition, but also not provide intense forms of attention for problem behavior, for instance. Okay, so I'm actually gonna share with you some data, and this might be a little tricky to see. I um, had to crop it and increase it so it, the quality isn't fantastic. But this is actually an assessment of PICA. Are any of you familiar with PICA? Yeah, you probably have some clients that engage in PICA, so that's um, eating um, inedible substances, and this can be life-threatening. Um, uh, if I'll, I'm gonna actually give a talk on uh, PICA, but um, I've worked with a client where we have like an X-ray of a safety pin in his caught in his throat. He went to the ER because he ate metal objects, and one got stuck in his throat, and we have the X-ray from that. It's it's pretty intense. So um, PICA can be maintained by automatic reinforcement. So there's something about eating the item that is reinforcing. It might be um, the flavor of it. It might be um, the stimulation in the mouth. There's something about it that's reinforcing. And so um, in this study, I won't talk too much about it, but what they, I'll show you this bottom graph that might be a little bit easier to look at. So in here, what they did is an alone baseline with PICA. So they baited the item, the room with, um, Items that are safe to ingest um, that we often bait rooms to assess pica. So it might be something like a dried noodle, or it might be a bean, or um, you can use little bits of paper to a certain extent. There's like some, uh, um, you actually have to collaborate with a medical professional to ask them. You literally have how much paper can a kid eat without it being a medical concern, or how many dried beans can a kid eat before it becomes what? We use rice paper. Did you? Oh, oh rice paper. Easy. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of neat things that you can use to make things um, like a different substance. So, like uh, bleach has that kind of thick quality. You know, it's not it's not like water. It's thicker than that. So they have this stuff called thicket that you add to liquids and it makes it thicker. And you can use blue food dye to basically create safe Windex or safe bleach so that they can drink it without you know hurting themselves. And you can actually assess the behavior. So what they did with Pike was they looked at matched and unmatched stimulation. So an example of matched stimulation is they might give them access to popcorn that might be similar to the crumbly nature of something that they might be eating. It might be kind of similar. Um, an unmatched stimu stimuli, uh, stimulus might be something like um, giving them access to music or letting them play with particular toys. And so what they did is they ran in the alone condition and showed that Pike could persist. And then they did match versus unmatched stimulation where they gave them non-contingent, free access to those different items um, the whole time continuously, and that reduced behavior down to zero levels. And then they went back to the alone baseline and uh, recaptured uh, rates of behavior. And then they went back into match and unmatched, but interestingly, with the unmatched stimuli, you get more behavior, more pica. So it might be with continuous exposure to unmatched stimulation because it's not really matching the function. It's merely competing with it. Over time, it might, that treatment effect might break down and it might be very important to use a, um, uh, some kind of matched stimulation. When you assess Pike, what did you all end up doing? Um, well, I didn't do it for sake myself. It uh -huh. was done with our team. Yeah. And it was just more, it's not something that was started. Mm -hmm. And so they just kind of assessed what it was and we found out it was just a picture. Okay. And so you had eating paper at school and it was, and it was just the texture of it in his mouth. Right. So we ended up trying to find like seaweed and you know, like other stuff that paper like mm -hmm. and created a snack line for him when he was at school. Such a great um, example, and that's an example of using match 
stimulation, yeah. right? Um, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I've never had to come up with a, compete, a match thing, uh, item for paper, um, but the seaweed, I like that. Seaweed works really good, rice paper, yeah. um, there's other food. You can have onion paper. paper, I remember my mom yeah. had onion paper when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, who uh, worked on teams that treated my dad? Have you worked with medical professionals to run blood tests and stuff to determine whether there might be an underlying medical cause that results in consumption of like dirt or other yeah. medical items? That's a good question. Um, yes, you do want to do that. You do want to rule, like you basically want to send them to a doctor and get all of that. Usually by the time they're referred, they've had a lot of that done already um, because that's usually the first line of defense because usually families are going to their pediatrician and saying that and then you might go ahead and um, do that. But you bring up a good point, which is um, to do the medical assessment because if there are biological causes or some kind of nutritional deficiency, then that's the, that's the avenue. So as behavior analysts, we need to identify that a behavioral intervention is appropriate for a client. And if it's um, um, something related to a nutritional def deficiency, then that would need to be addressed. And maybe in conjunction with the behavioral intervention temporarily to kind of um, uh, assist with the behavior, even though, because the behavior might persist even though the nutritional def uh, deficiency is still not there. Okay, so we won't do this in a small group. I'm just going to kind of talk to you about this, but what I want to do is show you a graph, um, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about it. So again, these are set up identically. You've got functions along the x-axis and then aggression uh, per minute along the y. And then we've got um, behavior that's happening in the attention condition, and then we have behavior that's happening in the ignore condition. So um, what are two possible functions that are indicated by this graph? Because 
we're not testing anything related to toys. So why are the toys in the control condition if that's not what we suspect to be maintaining behavior? So that's just kind of an example of um, uh, inappropriate use of uh, the control condition. So you do want to kind of think about, um, you know, if there is some kind of discriminative stimulus, usually it's the presence of someone. And then also, what you want to set up, the most important thing, is to create abolishing operations for the establishing operations that are arranged in the test condition. So in the attention test condition, what is the EO? What's the establishing operation? Yeah, withdrawal, with removal of attention. That's the EO. So what's the AO to that? <coughs> yeah, paying attention to them all the time. So um, that's kind of what you want. So anytime you have a test condition like attention, then you're going to do the complement in the control condition. So if you're just running attention and demand as test conditions, you see why <coughs> the toys seem a little odd in the toy place? Because it's like, well, you're not assessing tangibles, and those items aren't appearing in any of the test conditions, so why have it in the control condition at all? So what I thought we would do, um, I think the best way to kind of wrap our heads around this is to talk about what those conditions would look like. So let's say that we're assessing attention only. What does the toy play condition look like? Yep, provide them attention. So that could look like you provide them attention all the time, continuously. I've also seen it where you provide it every like five to 10 seconds, but briefly, like, wow, that's really cool. Like, it's a really nice day out, but it's not kind of um, as intense. Mm -hmm. I think for the control condition, um, as long as you don't think that attention might evoke behavior, it's a good bet to do it continuously. Because if behavior is maintained by attention, and you withdraw that attention for just a few seconds during the control condition, that might evoke behavior. So rather than even entering into that situation, just provide attention the entire time. Let's say that you have an escape from attention condition. So I'm talking to the person the whole time, and that's the EO that I, no, well not the whole time, but before problem behavior happens. And um, what would the compliment be in the control condition? Yeah, ignore, you can ignore condition. What about tangible and escape? What would that toy play look like? Tangible, do they do with toys? Yep, they get toys the whole time. What about demands? No demands. Now here's the thing that happens. We are, we work with kids and we teach them skills. And so when we're, when we see kids or individuals with toys or leisure items and they're, um, we might be inclined to provide some things that seem like demands. Like, oh, that's really cool, can I have a toy? That's a demand, that could evoke behavior, that doesn't happen in the control condition. Oh, can you uh, stack this on top of the block? Oh, that's really cool. All of those are actually demands, and so none of that needs to be in the control condition. So if you do have toys in the control condition, be very mindful about how you're talking to them about the toys. It's mostly like, that's a really cool toy, you never try to take the toy. Like, oh, I'm going to play too, because this is, this is what we do usually for a living, is that when we're, we don't typically ignore kids that are playing with toys. We interact with them. We're trying to get some reciprocity going and things like that, and so this is not the time for us. This is the time to, um, to not do that and to not provide any kind of demands on, on the toy play itself. Um, so what about attention? Like, if you have tangible and escape as test conditions in the control condition, what do you do about attention? Like, what does it look like from the perspective of the client? What are they doing the whole time, probably? You're just playing with the toy. You're not saying anything. You just give them the toy. Because you're not going to present any demands. And you're going to give them continuous access to the tangible. So you don't need to talk to them at all. Because we're not assessing attention as a function. So why do it if we don't have to? Um, what about if you're assessing automatic reinforcement? Let's say that it is some kind of tactile stimulation from hand mouthing. That's the, that's the hypothesized uh, stimulation. That's not what it is. It is a little, it's, you know, it's, it's challenging. You gotta figure out a way to provide tactile stimulation without yeah, you gotta figure out. It's probably like giving them non-contingent access to a match. Snails. 
Alternatively, you could do something like, um, you could use potentially like a response blocking, like extinction kind of control condition where if it's hand mouthing, you might put a blow on their hand because then the, the stimulation isn't the same and it's blocking it, so it's more of an extinction condition because again, we can't control the access, the reinforcer, so um, in the control condition, if we give them that stimulation, um, they may or may not engage with it. Mm -hmm. So um, it might be reasonable to do um, some kind of extinction, sensory extinction condition, but um, I think that what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that there is no right or wrong. It's about looking at these things in context and then making decisions. And sometimes it doesn't work out the first time and we have to make some adjustments. So maybe you try match stimulation as a control condition that didn't work out. So maybe then you'll go to a sensory extinction control condition. But really we just want to end up in a situation where if the test control is re, uh, resulting in high levels of behavior, we want to find a control condition that results in low levels of behavior so that we have a, a, a way to <coughs> identify the function. Um, what about uh, escape from, oh, I guess that's the same as the second one, so I'll skip that. You were in, um, um, I was I, thinking in that, Laura, if, if you were, when I saw that attention as a social interaction, you were referring to attention from one person or if in social interaction among two people mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Oh yeah, that can absolutely oh, yeah. happen. Okay. They can either um, engage in behavior to get in on that conversation mm -hmm. or they can engage in behavior to get away from that conversation. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the, um, the client. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you are interested in additional resources, there are a couple that I thought I'd tell you about. One that's really neat is that this YouTube video is actually a functional analysis of thumb sucking. And one of the reasons why I think it's really neat is because if you ever, it's a duration-based behavior. And they actually have the whole functional analysis, so you can practice collecting data. You kind of see what one looks like for, for um, thumb sucking. It's not perfect, but it is a pretty good example of one, and it's a behavior that is um, not very dangerous. Although it happens, you know, this is certainly something that um, you know, breaking thumb sucking is certainly a goal uh, in, in, uh, for some children. So you might take a look at that, and then also uh, Western Michigan University's autism. Uh, Center for Excellence is basically producing a bunch of videos on a variety of topics in behavior analysis like preference assessments. They have Isaac De Leon and some other folks. Um, and uh, Brian Wada did uh, two that are, one is on functional analysis of problem behavior, the other one is on functional analysis of SIB. The cool thing is that one or both of these have also been, have um, Spanish subtitles. So um, it's also, they're, they're working on trying to increase the audience. Mm -hmm. um, with those videos, but you might want to check out those resources in general. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and the announcement hasn't come out yet, but I already know about it, is I'm going to do um, a circa uh, workshop on the assessment of pica and elopement because those pose some different. The topo usually we focus so much on function, but sometimes the topography of the behavior absolutely impacts the way that you assess it, and so pica and elopement bring some unique. Um, opportunities for the behavior analyst to problem solve, and I'll also talk to you about how to create pipe items. Um, I hope that you come because you want to some kind of things What? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's unacceptable. <laughs> that's not a good enough excuse. But um, it's on June 8th at one, and there will be an announcement sent out soon. And then, if any of you didn't catch it, I will send a PDF of this uh, presentation if you're interested. And um, if you didn't, there's just a little sign up there if you want to, and you can feel free. To Free to email me if you have any follow up questions about this material. Mm -hmm. um, do you have follow up questions? Yeah. All right, well, this was fun for me. I hope that it was fun for you. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. This is exciting. <laughs>